56 to 7, that Her Majesty the Queen has signified her royal assent to the following acts. Offensive Weapons Act, Mental Capacity Amendment Act. Hmm. Baroness Donaghy. I beg leave to ask a question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, the Government remains committed to supporting local authorities and other social work employers to meet their duties regarding social work workforce planning and helping them to understand best practice in recruiting, retaining and developing staff. We have invested over £1.2 billion since 2010 in supporting both mainstream and fast-track qualifying routes into the profession, and our improvements to the supervision and leadership social workers receive are supporting people to remain and progress in social work. I thank the noble lady minister for that answer, but I don't think that they can fulfil their requirements and all their responsibility. I think that the workloads, particularly for directly employed local authority social workers, are, must be at red on the risk register and must have been like that for some years. Um, and I think the stress levels, the staff shortage and the inability of some areas to recruit, I think it's 26% vacancy rate in London, must say that this has to have a much higher priority than this government is prepared to make. Could the noble lady give some more practical answers about how to stop social workers leaving the profession, and that is increasing, uh, to try to recruit more, and there's a 6% drop, and see if we can't get some support for a very, very pressed uh, service. Yeah. Well, I thank the noble Baroness for what is a very important question. She is absolutely right that we have to ensure that we recruit and retain the social workforce. It is vital, and local authorities, like any employers, are responsible for ensuring that they have the right staff with the right skills. But the government also recognises that we have a role to support them. Um, that is why we are providing financial support to students who qualify as social workers. That is why we are making sure that those entering social work receive the best training possible uh, with some new tra training programmes to support those who are newly qualified, such as the assessed supported year in employment, um, so that those who do come in place uh, with uh, quite a significant uh, workload in their first year can have some support in that first year. And also, uh, we do understand that high caseloads can be a challenge. Local authorities are responsible for recruitment and deployment of social workers, um, but we are working with them to think about how they can best manage the delivery of services and make caseloads manageable so that we do retain those social workers um, who are vital to deliver delivering care and support for some of the most vulnerable in our society. My Lord. My Lord. As has already been said, been very stressful. So can my noble friend say exactly how we are supporting um, young social workers, graduates, um, she said a little bit uh, uh, in terms of that, but in their first, second and third year so that we can actually retain them well, I thank my noble friend for her question. She is absolutely right um, that social workers do um, vital jobs, that it is an attractive career choice. We have more than 4,000 students enrolling in social work courses every year, um, and we have introduced a fast-track graduate programme which has brought 2,000 more into the social work programme, but is only um, going to work if we retain those within the um, system. So we have developed some post-qualifying standards for social workers at key stages of their career to create a consistent and practical based career profession and in particular we have introduced the assessed year in um, the workforce to provide that key level of support in the first year so that those who do um, experience um, the shock of um, the caseload in that first year do have the support that they need to remain in the profession and develop the key <coughs> skills that they need to be able to manage um, that workload. My Lord, my Lord, as a former family judge I worked very closely with social workers and I wonder if the noble lady, the minister, would consider an aspect which is a lack of respect and a lack of status. And I think if they were given a better status, it would be much easier both to recruit and to retain. Well, the noble baroness makes an absolutely excellent point. Social workers uh, play a crucial role in our society. They should have the respect and the status which they deserve for the vital role which they do play. Um, I think one of the ways in which um, this uh, respect and the status can be achieved is by the increasing professional standards which are being brought into the service, um, as I have said, by bringing in key reforms such as improving leadership, providing high quality, continuous professional development to seek to improve the quality 
quality of um, social workers' professional lives, but also to raise standards and recognition for that uh, uh, um, for the profession. My lords, the named social worker programme demonstrates a new way to support people with particularly vulnerable who are particularly vulnerable. Social workers and their clients felt more confident and supported. Social workers felt more job satisfaction, and we just heard how important that is. So would the Minister tell the House what plans there are to expand this programme to more areas? Well, I thank the uh, noble Baroness uh, for her question. She is absolutely right that that is a vital part of the programme uh, which is in place. It is part of a wider suite of programmes which have been introduced so that we can bring individuals into social work for, at different points within the system. This has included the new social work degree apprenticeship scheme. Um, as I have said, um, we have a number of those who are entering into the normal degree programme, 4,000 a year. We have also um, introduced the fast track training programme for high potential graduates and also the Think Ahead graduate programme for mental health social work. We are trying to attack this challenge from all angles, as well as in, in um, guaranteeing that we retain those within the system by having continuous professional development for those once they are in the profession, so that we can ensure that, as she rightly says, it is a rewarding profession, but it is also one where those who are in it feel supported and um, feel like they have um, the, the skills which they need to deliver for the most vulnerable within our community. Uh, my Lords, the Noble Lady the Minister said earlier this week that the need to ensure that we recruit, retain and build on workforce development is at the heart of the social care green paper when it comes. Has she anything further to say about when we will actually get the green paper other than it's going to be very important? And in view of the chronic problems of low morale, inadequate pay in the face of unmanageable caseloads and resulting problems in providing key services to vulnerable people that we've heard about today, can she assure the House that making sure the value of social work, care work is valued is recognised as a top priority in the Green Paper? Well, the noble Baroness um, will know that we discussed this but two days ago, and I am happy um, to reassure her that social work and the social care workforce um, will be um, absolutely core, not only within um, the social work green paper, but also, of course, within the workforce strategy, which will be coming forward imminently. She is absolutely right um, that we must ensure that um, we have um, the right uh, models for social work, the social care workforce, to retain it and recruit them, but we must also have the right funding, um, and that is one of the reasons why the government has invested £9.4 billion um, over the last few years in social uh, work, but it is also why we have to make sure that we integrate the long-term plan, the Social Care Green Paper, alongside the funding settlement for the local authority funding, and that is part of the reason why we are working in the way that we are to bring these papers forward. My Lords, my Lords. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question in my name on the order paper. <clears throat> My Lords, the Government believes it is vital that children are well informed about climate change. For this reason, relevant topics are included throughout the geography and science national curriculum and associated qualifications. For example, in secondary school science, pupils consider the evidence of human causes of climate change. As part of GCSE geography, they study spatial and temporal characteristics of climatic change and evidence for different causes, including human activity. My lords, uh, many head teachers have an, well, head teachers have an <laughs> obligation not to teach uh, push causes which are seen as uh, party political, um, and therefore they feel that uh, teaching on climate change may cause problems. Could the government categorically state that the teaching on climate change is not a party political issue, and would be the government be prepared to meet with representatives of the teaching unions and head teachers to, te to make sure that they understand this? <laughs> I absolutely agree with the Noble Lord. This is not a party political issue. We are, this is a generational issue, and it's our responsibility, of the mostly ageing, to protect the environment for the young people of tomorrow. It, we do not in any way suggest that teaching these issues is party political. We have such things as the Great Green British Week, which for the first time last year, to raise awareness of how businesses, universities and schools and the public can contribute to tackling climate change. And we will be use, doing another one of these in November. I'm certainly happy to meet the unions and the stakeholders that the Noble Lord referred to. In which case, could I ask the Minister if he would locate maybe some tip top teachers in the schools, <coughs> providing the science on climate change to our young citizens, to maybe invite them to come to this place for a day to teach <laughs> the climate change deniers in this house? <laughs> 
what the young people are being taught, because they were conspicuous by their absence in the recent debate. They clearly haven't got the confidence to put their case, but the fact is the science is there, and I think it would be a suitable opportunity across the generations to deliver the science to them. Yeah. My Lord, there's absolutely no suggestion that there is denial of climate change by this government. Indeed, we have seen some of the most dramatic improvements in, 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 in dealing with the carbonisation of the economy over the last 10 years. We are leading the way in the G20. We, are, we have reduced climate by carbon uh, we've reduced carbon in the economy by 4.7 per cent per year, which is double the G7 average. We have some of the highest levels of wind generation in the world. So I can assure the noble lord that we are not anti or against it. That we also, though, have to remember that it's not just climate change we should worry about. It is about cl clim climatic, but about environmental contamination. My, lord. my lords, may I draw attention to my interests in the Register of Interests? Will my uh, noble friend ensure that climate change is taught within the context of the scientific method, which requires predictions based on hypothesis to be tested against observations? And therefore, let children know that the impact of CO2 is well established by observations, can be measured, and the direct effect of doubling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere will be one degree centigrade increase in the average temperature of the globe, but higher estimates based on much less certain feedbacks for which there is not observational confirmation, and all the forecasts uh, based on climate mo models assume very high feedbacks which have been falsified by observations, and therefore those models need to be amended. Well, I can assure the noble lord that, the, that we are improving the curriculum all the time. For example, 20, 90, in 2018, 96% of pupils in state-funded schools were entered for the science component of the EBAC. The proportion of pupils taking GCSE geography has increased from 26% in 2010 to 41% last year. We've also seen increases in participation in A-level chemistry and physics. These are all science and evidence-based subjects. Could, we, could the government get um, the United States President to drop in on one of these classes during his visit? <laughs> the noble lord makes a very interesting suggestion, and I will pass it on to the Foreign Office. My lords, the uh, uh, noble lord's comments about science and geography being taught in schools clearly is not effective enough because uh, students in Oxford have started a national petition. Uh, to have uh, climate change become a core part of the, of the curriculum. It's so far attracted 71,000 signatures. So young people are getting the message, and it seems MPs are as well, because two weeks ago a Labour motion to uh, formally declare a climate and environment emergency in another place was endorsed without a vote. And the Environment Secretary, I should say, uh, contributed, uh, responded to that debate by saying the situation we face is an emergency. So that endorses uh, the noble Lord the Minister's point about not being party political. I very much welcome that. So uh, given the, 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 uh, Mr Gove's wise words, can I build uh, perhaps on the point made by the noble Lord Lord Singh that um, does the noble Lord the Minister know whether Mr Gove will raise with Donald Trump during his visit the fact that climate change is a very real threat and that ignoring international agreements and action on the climate crisis is something he can no longer do. <clears throat> my Lords, I'm not sure whether my honourable friend Michael Gove is meeting Mr Trump, but I'm sure that he will raise these issues with him. But I, I do want to just, just to put a slightly different uh, slant on things. The, the enormous progress that we are making in this country to combat climate change. I mentioned to an, an earlier question, we are leading the world in wind power generation, offshore wind power generation. The cost of that per kilowatt hour has dropped dramatically in the last five years. We have created a Green Finance Institute. We have a record proportion of our energy being generated by low carbon sources and indeed in the last few weeks I think we've had the first evidence of generation of electricity without any coal at all. We've dramatically reduced the role of coal-fired energy in, any, in, in generation. So I think we must just remember that we are doing an enormous amount and one, it, it, uh, 
in climatic change a concern, my priority is that we adapt to deal with the consequences of it. Noble Lord, the Minister is absolutely correct to uh, lay down and lay out the measures that the Government has already taken. Isn't the Noble Lord, Lord Rooker, right that young people are aware and frightened of the effects of climate change and environmental degradation, and that they are asking us, as the generations it represented in this House, to make a step change in what we're doing, and resting on our laurels will not protect our grandchildren. I would respectfully disagree with the noble baroness that we are resting on our laurels. I just gave some examples of the things we're doing and how we are leading in the developed world in, in, in developing a carbon-reduced economy. We've only re very recently introduced the 25-year environment plan, which encourages children as well to participate. I, I absolutely think we are on track, but we have to keep this in the public eye. Lord Greaves. My Lord, I beg leave to ask the question. My Lords, uh, we are trialling biocontrol methods to control Japanese knotweed. The Centre for Agriculture and Bioscience International is working to establish the highly specific psyllid Aphalara itidori into the United Kingdom. This summer, a population of more climatically suitable psyllid from Japan will be brought here. It is hoped this will be the key to unlocking the potential of this agent to reduce the effort and cost of managing Japanese knotweed and indeed its invasive capacity. Lords, it's 30 years since Lady Sharple started asking these <laughs> questions about Japanese knotweed, and about 12 or 15 since I joined her, and all we do is get the same answer every time, that this wonderful psyllid, Afalara, will come galloping over the horizon and solve everything. Um, it's absolutely clear that the problem of Japanese knotweed is just getting worse and worse and causing more and more problems, and it is simply not being tackled. Does the government agree that two things need doing? The first is that owners of land uh, need to be put under a legal obligation to eradicate Japanese knotweed, and allowing it to grow should be an offence. And secondly, does the government not agree that when transactions or contracts relating to land that has Japanese knotweed on it, or people going walking on it who might spread it, that they should be notified that this dreadful and awful weed exists or has recently existed on the land? Um, my Lords, I can assure the noble Lord. Um, the, Trials often take longer than we would wish, but we think and we're working in collaboration with Canada uh, because they have a similar problem. We're working with experts across Europe, the United States, and as say, in Canada. And I agree, it's frustrating that the psyllid hasn't established as we would have wished. We are also working on another form of um, control, which again is under uh, valuation, which, uh, which is a, a mycoherbicide. All of this is part of using the science, but I agree with the noble lord that it is very invasive. That's why I'm going to be reading the science and technology report that came out this morning on some of their advices, because we do need to attend to this. But the problem about the noble lord's first point is that, say someone fly tips spoil with... Uh, with uh, uh, elements of Japanese knotweed, is the landowner then really going to be required to remove that fly tip? That is the problem if you made it a legal liability for the landowner to remove it. Well, now, could my noble friend have a word or two with the Highways Agency? The Highways Agency have recently been spraying all over the place to kill insects. Um, that's rather dubious in many ways, its effects, apart from keeping our car windscreens rather cleaner. Um, but there is knotweed and other noxious weeds, which surely are covered by the Noxious Weeds Act, all the way along the sides of our motorways. Why not get them to do something? Well, certainly I would say we are very strongly of the view that we need to look after our pollinators and insects so that we shouldn't be cutting verges unless it is necessary for safety. 
Uh, certainly this is an issue I will take up with my transport colleagues, but I do know that both Highways England and indeed specifically Network Rail are conscious of their responsibilities, and indeed there have been uh, cases with uh, Network Rail where they have been required to attend to Japanese knotweed. So this is a real problem, and landowners, I do encourage to attend to it. My Lords, we're all indebted to the noble Lord Lord. This side. This side, I think. This I think it's this side. We're all indebted to the noble Lord for continuing to raise this issue. It is very serious, and many thousands of people have difficulties in selling their houses because of the existence of Japanese knotweed. Now, we all hope that the bio approach works, but it's going to take several years. The government can't deal with it. It, there, it remains with the local authorities to handle it. Can they step up their efforts on advice on the herbicide approach to tackle the problem today, to fill the gap before the bio approach comes in? Um, the noble lord raises something which I think is really important, and there is a very good practice manual which has been published as part of a rapid life project which shows all the varying ways in which this can be dealt with. All of them have their issues because, of course, the rhizome and the ability for the rhizome to continue even dormant for 20 years is why actually glyphosate, properly used, and I emphasise properly used by trained people, but in about two or three years you can uh, kill the uh, Japanese knotweed. So there are a range of issues. Obviously, the biocontrol would be preferable in terms of reducing the aggressiveness of the growth, but there are a whole range of issues, and I'm very happy to share this manual with the noble lord. My lord, my lord. Sir, my lord. It's, uh, <coughs> I draw attention to my interests in the register. Of course, knotweed isn't the only invasive alien species around, and this is invasive alien species week. Indeed, the minister has been seen digging up um, skunk cabbages in the newspapers. But um, I wondered whether he can confirm that the government is intensifying its efforts to combat invasive alien species in general and in particular the grey squirrel, which is doing so much, so distressing yeah, yeah, yeah. to yes. kill our broadleaf trees. Yeah, yeah. My Lords, it is indeed invasive species of week, and I would have very much enjoyed it if your Lordships had been with me in a ditch in Kent digging up American skunk cabbage. This is being undertaken by volunteers, my Lords, working in local action groups, and if I could say, if anyone wishes to Google Invasive Species Week, they will find all the places where they can go and help and work with teams. Grey squirrels, they are one of the reasons why people aren't planting trees, my Lords. If we do not find ways of controlling the grey squirrel, we will not have the treescape for future generations, and that is why the investment, and the noble Earl has been working very hard on this, I know, the investment in a fertility research, which will make the grey squirrel infertile, we think has a lot of prospects and will be a way of helping to control this very invasive species. Lord Dykes. My Lord, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Uh, my Lords, the Government and Opposition are continuing discussions to try and find a way forward on EU exit that could command a majority in Parliament and which would allow for the UK's smooth and orderly exit from the EU. Meetings with the opposition have been constructive, with many areas of consensus. The Government has committed to bringing forward the Withdrawal Agreement Bill in the week commencing the 3rd of June. Did the, did, did, the, <laughs> did the Minister notice the huge dismay that greeted Theresa May's astounding proposal to prolong the Brexit agony, a dismay that was actually led by our own MPs. Rather than leading this miserable and unhappy country through further parliamentary nightmares, isn't it high time that the Prime Minister had the wisdom to restore national morale by promising either revocation of Article 50 or indeed a people's vote with the Electoral Commission in charge? Well, as I have uh, responded to the noble lord on this issue a number of times, let me repeat that we are not in favour of revoking Article 50, and uh, we believe that any second referendum would be divisive without being decisive. Yeah. My lord, could my noble friend remind those in the ERG and those on the opposite side who say they want to see some sort of Brexit enacted that there is a golden opportunity and half a loaf is better than no bread 
by voting for this bill when it comes before the other House? Um, well, I would totally agree with my noble friend. Um, I'm sure they are taking careful note of his words. But democracy is a dialogue, and it requires governments to carry their publics with them and to continue to explain what the rationale for their policies are. Part of the problem we're now in is what we're getting from different members of the Cabinet are a range of different opinions, and we're not getting any clear message about what is possible and what is not possible in terms of getting out of the hole we're now in on Brexit. When can we expect the government to return to Parliament and explain what it thinks is a possible exit from where we are and what it thinks is not possible? Well, what we think is possible is the agreement that we have negotiated. We think this... Uh, well, the EU has said that this is the only agreement uh, possible. Now, I know that the Noble Lords Party don't believe in respecting the results of the referendum, but we do, and if we want to implement it, then we think that the agreement that we have negotiated is the best way of achieving it. Can I remind the Minister that the question asks him about reporting to Parliament yes. the outcome of these deliberations. Once again, he's avoiding the question, he's answering questions from his own imagination and not the question that Parliament actually wants an answer on. Yeah. When will he learn his responsibility to Parliament, the Parliament that we had the referendum, where his side were arguing we must take back control? Yeah. Well, I mean... Uh, the same as the opposition, we, uh, we want to respect the confidentiality of those talks. I'm sure when and if they reach an agreement, then both sides will want to report uh, back to Parliament in full on them. Right, the Lord, Lord Tomlinson uh, makes a statement from within Parliament, which we all well understand, and we see the complexities of what is going on. But it's important to remember, is it not, I ask my noble friend, but from outside, what people see is that the population voted to go out of the, of the Union and Parliament is vigorously obstructing it. That is not democracy and it is what will bring the whole organisation down fairly quickly unless we try to get into, into tune with the population that the House of Commons is supposed to represent. Yeah. 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 Uh, as ever, my noble friend speaks extremely wisely on these uh, matters. I totally agree with him that not implementing the results of the referendum would be disastrous for our democracy. It must seem to people outside that, uh, going back to the previous answer from my uh, noble friend on Japanese knotweed, that leaving the EU seems to be about as difficult as eradicating Japanese knotweed. My Lords, it is not a question of whether we leave that I think is in front of us, but the question of how we leave. And as we've kept saying, the withdrawal deal is not the right one to bring us out. We've now heard from uh, Mr Fox, for example, that, there will, that the deal that we've got at the moment in front of us has to involve checks at or near the Northern Ireland border. So the question is not whether we respect the, the referendum. It is the matter that the government has not come forward with a deal that is acceptable either to most of his party or indeed to mine. I, I thank the noble lady for her um, inference in her question that Labour respects the referendum result and uh, obviously totally agree with that. I think if that is the case, then I think it's, uh, it's beholden on the Labour Party to tell us which bits of the withdrawal agreement they don't like. Is it the citizens' rights protection? Is it the financial settlement? Is it the implementation period? Is it the Northern Ireland Protocol? Which bits do they not actually like? How, how does the government respond to the concern that any potential agreement is likely to be repudiated by any successor to the Prime Minister. Well, I think the um, noble lord is getting ahead of himself. Um, you know, the withdrawal agreement bill has uh, the withdrawal agreement has been negotiated uh, by the by the government. We stand by that. Uh, the EU have made it clear that it is the only and best uh, agreement available, and uh, that will be reflected in the legislation that we bring forward. As I hope Parliament will consider in all seriousness. My Lords, everybody knows that the Withdrawal Agreement Bill stands no chance of passing its second reading in the House of Commons. So first, why is the Government bringing it forward in any way? And secondly, when it has lost that vote, what does it plan to do then? Well, the Noble Lord is asking me hypothetical questions. I remain confident that uh, Parliament will want to reflect the results of the referendum 
they will see the messages that are being transmitted by the electorate and will want to make sure that the referendum result is honoured and we leave the EU in a smooth and orderly manner. Lords, I wonder if the Minister could confirm that the Brexit shambles is one of the few fiascos we cannot blame on Chris Grayling. <laughs> I, uh, I worked very closely with Chris Grayling in the uh, Ministry of uh, Department for Transport and uh, I disagree with the noble lord. I think uh, Chris Reading is doing an excellent job as Secretary of State for Transport. 